Thank you all for coming. Uh, this is the um, next in our ongoing monthly series looking at different public health and policy issues in uh, the context of the new administration and the 115th Congress. Uh, my name is Colleen Berry, and I am the chair of the Department of Health Policy and Management, and I'm so pleased to uh, welcome you all today to, I think, what will be a, an interesting and stimulating and important session. Uh, let me, before I begin uh, the focus on this session, remind you um, a a and invite you to join us on May 9th for the next installment in the series, which is uh, focused on um, the question of whether transportation and infrastructure can be a win for public health under the new administration. So that is where we're going next. Today, um, our seminar, Challenges for Science and Environmental Health Policy, uh, is a co-sponsored event, uh, co-sponsored by my department, Health Policy and Management, um, the Department of Environmental Health and Engineering, and the Johns Hopkins Risk Sciences and Public Policy Institute. Uh, we are, I think, going to uh, pass some index cards around uh, if people want to write questions down uh, to ask our panelists to the extent that we have time or potentially we can do it more informally at the end of just uh, uh, having folks raise their hand and ask the questions directly to the panelists. Um, but without further ado, I want to uh, quickly provide a brief introduction for each of our speakers so you have some sense of the expertise we have in the room to, to talk through these issues. Um, the opening speaker uh, and the person that's going to provide some opening remarks to put this issue in context is uh, Marsha wills Carp, who is uh, the chair of the Department of Environmental Health and Engineering and a national leader in immunology and environmental health. Uh, she's the Anna Bezier Professor uh, within her department, and she's a leader um, in the study of uh, genetic and environmental causes of respiratory diseases, such as asthma, and has made contributions uh, in the understanding of the immun immunological mechanisms by which exposures to environmental um, uh, allergens, airborne pollutants, induced respiratory diseases. She's also studied the impact of air pollution on premature births and obesity in humans. Um, she will provide opening remarks, and following those opening remarks, we have three wonderful panelists here, uh, including uh, David DeJack, who is Executive Director and CEO of the National Environmental Health Association. He has contributed to many uh, national and international advisory committees in public health in the area of environmental health. Under his leadership, the Association is actively engaged in national policy in Washington. He earned his doctorate in public health from the University of Michigan and uh, an MSPH from the University of Utah and is a board certified industrial hygienist. Uh, jo Joanna, uh, Joanna Slaney is the Legislative Director for the Environmental Defense Fund's Health Program, where she works on policy and uh, governmental relations. For the past four years, she's focused on advancing legislation to reform um, the uh, primary chemical safety law, the Toxic Substances Control Act. Her work on uh, chemical safety includes food additives and lead exposure, and she's also worked on regulatory safeguards for public health and the environment. Before uh, coming to the Environmental Defense Fund, she spent 25 years on uh, Capitol Hill at the White House and as a consultant serving as Special Assistant for Legislative Affairs in the Clinton Administration, uh, and she worked for or former Senator Carol Mosley Braun. Finally, I'm so pleased uh, to uh, welcome t our own Tom Burke as our uh, third speaker. Tom just recently returned to the Bloomberg School, um, where uh, after a stint serving as Deputy Assistant Administrator of, Environment of the EPA's Office of Research and Development, where he served as the agency's scientific advisor under the Obama administration. Uh, we are so pleased to welcome Tom back 
to campus um, and to continue his role as the Fabricant Professor in Health, Risk, and Society. Uh, so without uh, further delay, I'd like to welcome Marsha Wolfskarp uh, for opening remarks. Marsha. So I thought I'd just set the stage for you, and I think I'm the only one that's going to have slides, but I think sometimes putting a little bit of a visual image on what the other speakers are going to tell you about is very uh, powerful. So I think I'm kind of preaching to the choir here as I look out into the audience, but I probably don't have to convince people in this room uh, that both our environment and our public health are at risk uh, with things that are going on uh, in the world today. So over the last 30 or 40 years, as we have modernized our world, uh, this has led to a lot of unintended consequences to our public health. Um, in water, you can see here the sludge and other chemicals that are coming out of these uh, reservoirs. Uh, this is somebody who's drinking water that's probably come from some water treatment plant in the world somewhere. And here you see that there's also a shortage of water, and for those folks in these regions, uh, this water is far from clean. It's quite contaminated. Uh, these are happening because of many different uh, problems. They're leaking from fuels, uh, sources around the world, drainage of household chemicals. We don't think about this when we dump those things down the sink or when we dump our prescription meds that we haven't used into the sink or the toilet. Landfill, there's crop runoff, industrial chemicals, uh, the aging water infrastructure, which I think Tom is going to tell you more about, and municipal water treatment failures. Every time there's a flood in Baltimore, there's hundreds of thousands of gallons of sewage, raw sewage, that dump into the bay. So these are the problems that are facing us. Now, all of those exposures have a great impact on our health. Uh, not only are there diarrheal diseases, uh, there are adult mortality, infant mortality, heart disease, premature birth, asthma exacerbation, and there's uh, accumulating evidence that many of these chemicals are, might be the hidden causes of autism, obesity, and cancers. So there's also a problem with the way that we're trying to f uh, feed the uh, overpopulation in the world. We've devised these high throughput farming uh, industry to meet that demand, but in doing so, we are having uh, detrimental effects on the environment. All of the refuge from these uh, animals is running off into our rivers and streams in the bay. Uh, they're being fed antibiotics to fatten them up so people can make more money for any given animal. Uh, they generate a lot of methane, and I'll come back to that in a moment. And there's runoff, uh, as I said, from the streams. All of those things are contributing to antibiotic resistance. Uh, and for those uh, I know who know a lot about uh, uh, antibiotics, there haven't been any new antibiotics designed in more than 40 years. So as we um, uh, have resistance to more and more of these antibiotics, it's going to put us at great health risk. So air pollution, which is what I focus on mostly, uh, you can see this is a day in Beijing, uh, but having been there not too uh, long ago, uh, even if you're not asthmatic, it's very tough to breathe. You can't even see a few feet in front of you. It's so thick, the pollution. That's caused from industry and automobiles. These are things that allow us to jet around the world, to drive cars, to do all the things that we like to do in our modern world. But they have the consequences of causing uh, climate change uh, through the, uh, the CO2 uh, emissions and uh, together with this big beef and uh, animal reservoir of methane contributing to climate change, which is affecting our environment uh, tremendously and will, at the end of the day, cause food insecurities around the world, which will lead to mi mass migrations and violence. Uh, there's water contamination. You can see flooding here. When these floods happen, all the chemicals and things that are in this environment go into the water supply, and not only the physical damage to the uh, actual buildings, uh, but sewage and other things accumulate. Uh, 
those effects on the climate are going to have many profound effects on our, our populations, uh, contaminating our food and water supply, water shortage. Water is going to be in the wrong place. There are many places that will suffer droughts. And shifts in infectious diseases uh, will also play have an impact. So in the 60s and 70s, we recognized that these exposures to uh, uh, pollutants in the air and the water were important. And we, uh, Congress enacted these two uh, Clean Water and Clean Air Act, uh, which have been essential in trying to mitigate many of these uh, industrial and other exposures uh, that we experience. These are both administered by the EPA. And over these 30 or 40 years, they've had major impacts on the quality of our air and water. However, what we're here today to talk about is that uh, the reversal of these uh, Clean Air and Clean Water Acts are going to have profound effects on our environment. And President Trump, I think it was one or two weeks ago, signed an executive order directing the EPA and the Army Corps of Engineers to begin repealing these acts. And so this is going to be catastrophic for our environment. Uh, there's also the intent to pull out of the Paris uh, Climate Change Agreement. And budgetary cutbacks to science and regulations in general will have profound effect on all of us, but for our, our health as well. The good news is these things can't be just changed overnight. And so it gives us, as a public health community, the opportunity to mount an opposition and try to impose upon Congress as well as the general public uh, that these things are very important and that we shouldn't be going down this road. But we aren't going to turn the clock back. So none of us are willing to give up our cars and all of our other luxuries that we have. So we need to come up with some sort of balance. Uh, because the opposition to these things is really from industry and, and jobs and loss of jobs. So we have to come up with solutions that allow us to live the lives we want but maintain our healthier environment. So I think the main charge to us as public health uh, advocates is to develop an effective means of communicating with the, the broader public and mount grassroots uh, opposition to rolling back these important legislative acts. And this is something that we haven't been that good at doing. So we really do need to hone our message, speak to the people that really matter, and speak to them where it matters to them. So I'm going to stop there. And I'm sure that our other speakers are going to go into more depth on this. But I just wanted to put it in perspective as to what's at risk uh, with these recent changes or changes that are yet to come. So thank you. So I'm, I'm going to speak in three acts. So pretend this is a theater and there's three acts to my, to my seven to 10 minutes. And, and my first act starts in 1989. Uh, I lived in Maryland at that point in time. And I just applied to the University of Utah for my MSPH. And something awful happened in Prince William Sound in Alaska. The Exxon, this very same Exxon uh, that we love to hate today, I had just spilled 10 million gallons of oil in Prince William Sound, and I was very angry. And I went to the University of Utah, uh, to the Rocky Mountain Center of Occupational and Environmental Health, and I st stumbled across a material safety data sheet from Exxon. Uh, do they still make MSDSs? Uh, yeah, okay, for students, uh, you know, th these are near and dear to your hearts. And so I called the number. And believe it or not, I got through to the medical director for Exxon. This is a true story. And what I said to the medical director, unbelievably, I didn't expect to get through to him. Uh, I said, I want to intern for you this upcoming year. And I only want to intern at the, at the uh, headquarters. Because I hated, disliked intensely Exxon so much, and I'm a twisted character, as you will quickly uh, understand, <laughs> that I felt I could understand uh, Exxon and why it did what it did by working in the belly of the beast. And you know what? They hired me, and they hired me at a really good salary for four months. 
And so I went to Texas. They relocated me and my family uh, to, uh, to, to Texas. And I spent the summer in underground coal mines in Illinois at leaking underground storage tank poles in Amarillo. Uh, I worked throughout the, uh, the state of Louisiana on gas and uh, oil refinery operations and in uh, mercury spill assessments all throughout the, the West. And you know, it was really interesting. I walked away from that experience. And by the way, they offered me a full-time job in the medical department on my way out. They said I was the first intern in their history that they'd uh, elected to, to offer a job to at the end of the summer. I was completely turned around uh, my, in my perception of the human beings that worked at Exxon. I didn't appreciate what happened in Prince William Sound, but virtually every person I met, and by the way, the bravest civilians I ever met are coal miners, the men and women who work in subsurface coal mines in the United States. That is very dangerous work. And they are very honorable people trying to make a living. Uh, so I didn't appreciate and still don't appreciate what happened in Prince William Sound. But the courage and the character and the commitment of individual human beings working in Exxon, uh, uh, whose commitment to a clean environment, to, to a healthy and safe uh, working conditions, uh, was, was, I was astounded by that. And so I walked away from Exxon. And by the way, I was offered a really good salary to stay at Exxon, uh, but I took a really bad salary to work at a Christian health sciences university. But that's, all, that's a whole other story. I could be retired right now, by the way, if, if I uh, stayed with Exxon, but I, I did not. But what I took away from that, what I learned in the spirit of academia, is that it was coal mining was the problem, not the coal miners. And so that has stayed with me uh, forever. Act two has two scenes, Tom Burke, plays an important part of something that happened two months ago. He gave a presentation at the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine in which he described wicked environmental health problems. Uh, these are problems that face the nation, uh, that are socially complicated, they're technically complicated, they don't have clear endpoints. Hopefully I got that right, Tom. And I took his list, I expanded on it, and with attribution, I discuss this in my talks around the country and increasingly around the world. Scene two of this conversation in Act Two happened last Wednesday. I was the lunch speaker at the California Environmental Health Association. 300 environmental health professionals from the state were getting together for continuing professional education. And the speakers before me were Steve Ann Stockham, the Director of Environmental Health for Riverside County, and Josh, who is the Director of Environmental Health for San Bernardino County, that same San Bernardino that was shot up uh, 15 months ago. They were talking about the 10 most important environmental health problems in the state that the practitioners in the 62 jurisdictions would have to deal with over the next 10 years. And, and Professor Burke, almost none of the issues that you had on your wicked list were on their list. Now there was some overlap around climate change and sustainability. Dr. Burke's list is correct. It is uh, technically, it's spot on. But the California list is also spot on. And what I learned from that is that there's a disconnect between what's happening in the nation's capital and in the learned institutions around the planet and what happens for boots on the ground environmental health professionals every day. Let's be clear, there are at least 16 different federal agencies that have a bite of the food safety apple, 16. And my brother that works for Procter & Gamble doesn't get it and thinks it's all a bunch of, of waste. So there's a lot of confusion out there when Dr. Burke has a list and California has a, has a different list. The third act and my final act uh, is, uh, and the stage is set for that, and each of us in this room uh, is an actor. It's true that there's been a three to five percent drop in local, state, and federal employment ranks since the Great Recession in 2010. That is true. But I looked on the way in today. There are 85,000 environmental scientists, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, uh, employed in this country at the local, state, federal level, uh, and in, pri in the private sector as of 2016. 85,000. How many epidemiologists, according to the BLS, are employed in the United States today? Fewer than 6,000. I would contend to you today that the single largest part of the public health workforce is environmental health. 
and we need to see them as an asset as opposed to such something that sits along the margin when we have other public health discussions. Let me be clear, if the federal government shut down today, HHS and CDC and, and HRSA and EPA, they all got sidelined, public health as we know it is environmental health across the United States. Environmental health is, is profoundly local. I'd like to close by saying uh, first to students, I think that there's plenty of employment opportunities and career opportunities for you when you graduate in six weeks. You might need to be creative with it. The seven uniform services, the uniform services are gonna get a lot of investment over the next several years. They have a very large and important role uh, to play for this country and there's a very large and important component of environmental and occupational health that's, that's part of it. As you graduate, remember the public in public health not just the science in public health. Number two, for mid-career professionals, get ready for leadership now. Remember to develop relationships with those folks that are your constituents, including people who disagree with you. And hopefully we'll get some questions about that uh, at the end of the, of the session. And then for senior leadership, we need to stitch together local and national concerns and we need to speak in one voice. We need to stitch together the fabric of the profession and frankly, we're too balkanized and fragmented, hence the wicked list and the California list not being harmonized. Two weeks ago, I spent the weekend in Taos, New Mexico and many of you know that Georgia O'Keeffe, the, the famous American artist, uh, originated from New York City, New York City. Uh, where she became a, a stalwart of the artist community. She went to Taos, New Mexico. It was so beautiful there. She said her life was broken in half by the natural beauty uh, there in, in New Mexico. Uh, it certainly is beautiful there. And as our life is broken in half with this new administration, I think it's time for us to, to engage as actors, hopefully rational actors, uh, in this third act that's upon us uh, with courage, with conviction, and with creativity because our time is, is, is upon us. And I think we have the intellectual wherewithal and the energy to address what's going on in Washington, D.C., but we need to talk to people who disagree with us. Those coal miners are waiting to hear from us. Let's take a good step forward and have a dialogue with them. Um, hi, I feel like when you do a Senate hearing, they have a little red light that tells you you've That's reached right. your time limit. So if somebody, if I talk too much, just wave your hand at me. Um, I left my phone in my bag. My name is Joanna Slaney. I'm the legislative director for the health program at Environmental Defense Fund. And we're an environmental NGO um, that uh, looks for solutions rooted in sound science and economics. Um, so we work with all sides. We look for solutions, but based in science. Um, and I'm here today to talk uh, about some of the specific um, legislative efforts that are going on around science. Um, so I am not a PhD. Um, I am not a public, you all know more about science than I do. What I know about is the Hill, uh, Capitol Hill. And so I'll talk about it from that perspective and the currently the defense work we're doing. It's all defense. Um, so in order to talk about sort of the anti-science efforts, because that's really what they are, I want to put it in a little bit of context, which is it's part of a broader anti-regulatory effort. It's called the reg reform effort or the regulatory reform effort. And it's basically an effort to make it harder and harder to regulate, um, not just for this administration, who's not going to be doing a lot of regulating, but for future administrations. So when we get back, so all of those pictures we saw on the slides at the beginning, all of the protections that we need in place to protect air and water and food, um, attempts are being made right now to make that harder and harder to do um, for the long term. I think Steve Bannon put it um, as uh, an administrative program for the deconstruction of the administrative state. So we have to look at science in that context because key to that effort is the effort to undermine the science upon which so many regulatory decisions are based. 
So if you can undermine the science, if you can make it harder and harder to use sound science, good science that's out there, then it's easier not to regulate. Um, because if you find out that mercury is poisoning people or that lead causes severe developmental problems, you have to regulate. If you can't find those out, if that information's not um, available, then the regulation doesn't follow. So I'm going to talk about two bills that have passed the House um, already, the House of Representatives. They both passed at the end of March. They haven't been introduced in the Senate yet, but will probably um, be introduced soon. And um, the Senate is going full bore ahead with regulatory reform, so-called regulatory reform. The first act is the Honest Act. Um, it's actually called the Honest and Open New EPA Science Treatment Act of 2017, or the Honest Act. Uh, it used to be called the Secret Science Reform Act. Um, and um, it passed uh, overwhelmingly in the House, although we did get seven Republicans to vote against it. And in this Congress, that's a victory in the House. Um, the, what the act does is it basically says that EPA um, not, cannot propose, finalize, disseminate a risk exposure or hazard assessment, criteria document, standard limitation, regulation, regulatory impact analysis or guidance unless, and this is, there are a couple of requirements, but the key one is the information is publicly available online in a manner that is sufficient for independent analysis and substantial reproduction of research resor results. So this sounds good. I was talking to a climate scientist at EDF, and he said, well, great. We want everybody to have all our climate research. We want people to be working collaboratively. Of course we want to share it. That's great, um, and we agree. But um, it actually would have a crippling effect. The, um, a previous version of this bill, another independent government agency, uh, predicted that 50% of the studies that EPA currently uses would not be able to be used. So EPA could only rely on half of the science it currently relies on to make uh, decisions, which is an extraordinary cut in the access to information. Um, the two key pieces are transparency and replicability. So transparency. Um, that means that studies with uh, confidential health information or confidential business information, trade secrets, if, if that wasn't publicly available, if you didn't want to put somebody's health records, the basic underlying data for a study, uh, um, make it public and put it online, it couldn't be used. Um, and there are a lot of ethical and legal concerns with putting out both trade secrets and public health, um, personal health data. Um, and I think you all can, we can do examples, but I think you can probably get where this is going. That, you know, a breast cancer study based on pollution, um, do those breast cancer patients want their information out there? No. So the bill was actually tweaked this year to say, OK, well, well, EPA will have to redact all that information, which is a huge burden for the agency. And then anybody who asks for the information can get it as long as they sign a confidentiality agreement based on guidance from the administrator. Again, a huge problem. So does Dow want BASF looking at their confidential business information as long as they sign a confidentiality agreement? Do I want my personal health records available to anybody? Um, no. So you can see that um, there still remain issues in the bill. It was not a great fix. Um, and the other issue is um, replicability. And again, I'm sure all of you know more about this, and Tom can talk about all of this. Um, but. Um, there are a number of places where you can't actually replicate a study very well. Um, longitudinal studies over 20 years starts in utero, deep water horizon spill, the health effects of first responders. You don't want to, there are times when you don't actually want to ethically recreate a study, or it would take 20 or 30 years, or um, it's not a good idea. <laughs> there are a bunch of reasons. So to take those studies out would be, again, up to 50% of EPA's studies could be removed from um, their access. Um, and there's actually a lot more in the bill. There are a lot of um, sort of anecdotal ridiculousness um, details of it, which I can talk about if anybody's interested later. Um, then quickly, I'll go to the, the Science Advisory Board Reform Act is the other bill that I want to talk briefly. Some people say the Honest Act goes after the scientists, and the, I mean, the Honest Act goes after the science, and the SAB Reform Act goes after the scientists. Um, and again, just the context, so public health, protecting public health and the environment is the goal. These bills are not intended to do that. So even though you could probably think, oh, there might be reasons for this or that, the, the intent behind them, the very clearly stated intent behind them is to allow industry to act without restriction. 
Um, and it, even the industry doesn't like it. Even a lot of good actors in industry say, if somebody else is cheating, if somebody else is cutting corners, that hurts my bottom line. We want to be good actors. So it hurts across the board. But quickly, the SAB Reform Act, um, basically what it does is it says if you, um, it allows people with conflicts of interest, particularly industry scientists with conflict of interest, to serve on SAB boards where they couldn't before as long as they disclose a conflict of interest. But if you receive EPA grant funding, you cannot serve. And you can't get EPA grant funding for several years after you serve on a board. So academic research, anything that receives any EPA funding, you would be precluded from serving. So it's trying to switch the boards so they're less um, academic, less, um, and more industry. That's the shorthand. Um, and finally, just briefly, I, again, this is part of a broader effort. So. This language, the Honest Act and the SAB Reform Act, we see the same language coming up in bill after bill. So the appropriations bill that handles EPA has um, language in the re report language that would basically cripple the SAB by requiring all of the scientists that serve to answer every single comment submitted to the board before they could reach a decision. So you can see that somebody could submit 1,000 questions, 10,000 questions. So written responses to all of that would actually make it hard for somebody who was not being paid to be on the board. <laughs> it would make it less uh, appealing to serve. Um, the, the regulatory, it also has bad honest act language. The Regulatory Accountability Act, one of the key reg reform bills that's going through the bad bills, has um, language from the Honest Act and um, President Trump's executive order. He did uh, in February that sets up a process for agencies to review regulations and propose regulations to be removed. Again, has some of that transparency language. So. It's not individual senators or representatives introducing individual bills. It's part of a broad effort. So I would have to say the people at EPA are fantastic. The career staff are working as hard as they can. We work with them as much as possible. They're you know, dedicated, committed, brilliant people. And they're actually taking good care of each other right now. There's a lot of camaraderie at the agency. Um, but it is, they are facing, um, you know, and I think Tom will talk more about this. But, um, so we're doing, there's a good fight to be had. So I just, I encourage everybody to join in this effort <laughs> to protect the science. Thanks, Joanna. And Dave, this is all right. Okay. So uh, first of all, I have to say this is personal to me. Uh, and many of you know me. I'm, I'm going to speak from the heart today as a, as a professor from Hopkins who had this amazing opportunity. And I was inspired to take advantage of that opportunity over in Feinstone Hall watching. And, and I'm not a political person. I've, I've tried to avoid that as a scientist. I've, I've served in, in public service before. Uh, for governors of both sides of the aisle. And I think it's important that we be objective and, and be aware of the objectivity and the independence of our science. But I was sitting there with literally hundreds of, of School of Public Health students watching the first inaugural dress of, of Barack Obama. And you can look it up and you can watch the tape. He said, and I'll quote, we'll restore science to its rightful place. Now, there have been a lot of, of, of questions about the ozone rule and, and many of the things that I was involved in both ozone and mercury before that in the Bush administration trying to bring science to the rulemaking process. And I said that day, I, I could work for this guy. I could be part of this. And so, you, you know, it's just kind of a little dream you put in the back of your head. And then the call came uh, to be part of the science leadership team in that administration. And I have to tell you, it was amazing. But when I first met with Gina McCarthy, the administrator of EPA, you get interviewed by about 50,000 people and vetted, and you have to turn over your tax returns, things like that. Just saying. Um, <laughs> um, and, and at the end of the interview, she said, do you have any questions for me? And I said, yeah, why do you want a public health professor? And she said, we have to reconnect EPA to public health. EPA is a public health agency, and people forget the fundamental mission. Right? And, and, and that's what I want to talk about, this opportunity. There's, there's 
There's lots going on, and it all starts with science. It starts with science and public health, evidence-based public health, evidence-based environmental policy. And EPA is very much a science agency. And I want to shout out, as Joanna mentioned, to the, to the great scientists there. I had an opportunity to work with almost 2,000 phenomenal scientists in research and development who covered the full range of those great disciplines that come together to make environmental health possible, including great epidemiologists and public health people. They are incredibly devoted. And, and like most of us in public health, it's not about the job. They know the roller coaster they're on, and they are incredibly dedicated. And so in, in my heart, I hate to see what's going on at the agency, but I know there's such a good talent pool there, and there's such devotion to what we're doing, and it is so important. So I can talk a little bit about what's happening at EPA, but, but mostly, I, I, and, and it's a lot of bad news. It, it's incredibly bad news. Uh, just think of it, every, every day, I, they told me it's gonna be a tough six months decompressing from you know, that, that kind of lofty perch, and, and it was pretty cool, drivers and White House meetings and Situation Room and all that, and now, you know, Hampton House. Uh, <laughs> but, but it's really tough every day to see the assault on science that's going on. As you know, I've been writing on this in, in, in the American Journal of Public Health, the New England Journal of Medicine, and some upcoming things in science, because there is a threat to the very credibility. And, and, and first of all, it's, it's from the top on down. Uh, okay, so, so think about the cascade of things. And this is the bad news, then I'll get to the good news. So, so we, unfortunately, we have a, a strong message from, as they say in the White House, they never say, Tom, the president wants you to do this. They say, the highest levels of government, and that's code for, uh-oh, uh, you gotta do this. The highest levels of government are denying the science uh, behind climate change. It's clear, and it's clear that those who would benefit most from policies that were less controlling on carbon emissions, the oil and gas industry and the coal industry, are, are very much well, maybe calling the shots now, literally. And, and so we have this shift from the top, but we also have this incredible budget cut, the highest of any of the agencies, 31%, but if you look at what it means to science and research and to us, um, to those of you who ever had a STAR grant, those of you who want to be a, a, a fellow at, at the US EPA, so many of our students have done that and have had great careers. Those possibilities will be shut down. So the scientific enterprise, not just at the agency, but the external granting mechanism, the excellence of the science advisory board, the peer review process is in jeopardy now from the top on through to the OMB mandates you got to admit it hurt when the director of OMB says, we're not going to waste money on climate research anymore. Mm -hmm. All right, that's, I'm paraphrasing, but pretty much the message. And you got to admit, the current administrator of EPA pulling back what we worked on, on pesticide hazards, and calling for better science that is not predetermined. Ouch. All right, that... To the scientific community, these things are real challenges. And so we see that. It's to, something for us to, to live with as scientists in this very tough era. What's most challenging for me is facing folks who, who are now into about their 22nd year of education and really wanted a career in public service. And with the freeze going on and the, and the reduction in force at EPA, which is projected at maybe 3,000 people, those dreams right now are not very reachable. And, and so, as Dave said, it's, a, it's an incredible community of environmental health professionals and we gotta get creative. So where's the good news in all this? Well, I passed around a, a little show and tell and you probably all figured out that that's, uh, that's indoor plumbing. And on one side, you see uh, the copper side of the pipe where you could actually see, imagine water going through that and the, and the other side you see this old galvanized steel pipe from about a hundred year old house uh, someplace near and dear to all of us and uh, and think about the challenge of clean water and so one of the most poignant moments for me with Gina McCarthy the administrator of EPA came in a church 
in Flint, Michigan, where I met with church leaders at the beginning of EPA's involvement in the crisis there. And, and I think that experience was, was very humbling, but also kind of lays out the challenge for us. Gina McCarthy very proudly introduced me, trying to explain that we're bringing our best national resources with CDC and EPA and the scientific leadership. And one very articulate lady pastor stood up and said, we don't need no science project. We need clean water. We've been pretty busy doing science projects and not communicating the importance of that. And so look at that pipe and think of all the science that has to get done before you can make that incredibly difficult public health decision that Pat Bricey and I were charged with making throughout the Flint crisis. Pat Bricey, wonderful colleague and friend from environmental health. When is it safe to drink the water? It's not safe to drink the water in Flint yet. It's safe to drink the filtered water. How will we put that together? And that's the scientific challenge. Our science is the public health underpinning of so many important environmental challenges, not just climate change, but day to day, we reach the lives of everyone. And it's not just the US, the whole world looks to our scientific leadership, which is now in danger. So what do we have to do, right? We have these, these challenges. I think it's time to, to really rethink how we translate science in public health, how we connect, why the folks who need our science most, those being impacted in the rural communities, perhaps by oil and gas exploration and their individual wells, who would never think of EPA as being a friend, of regulation being a friend. How do we communicate the importance of our mission to the broader public? And I think as, as Marsha opened the challenge, we have a communication challenge ahead. We also believe you will have funding challenges and justification of what we do. Uh, but there's a tough road ahead, but I am optimistic about it. I'm optimistic because every day, every day when I was down there working in Washington, there was a public health challenge that drew upon the expertise of public health scientists and environmental scientists, whether it was Zika, the Ebola cleanup, the safety of our schools. Most of that is not in the headlines, but as Dave mentioned, the front lines of public health is where environmental health happens. We have to reconnect with that, and that's the challenge ahead. And I think that's the message of getting through these next few years as we perhaps redefine. When we run out of money, we get real creative in environmental health, and it's time. So I'll stop there. Thank you to our three panelists. We have about 15 minutes to um, ask questions and have a conversation. So who would like to start? Yes, please. Um, my name is Sterling. I'm here in the, in the HBM program. Um, for those of us that you alluded to in our 22nd year of education, what, what do we do next? I mean, in this administration, we've got a bunch of hired foxes burning in houses. Is there a way in? To, to impact this. I mean, we can write articles and we can write op-eds and we can march in Washington and we can do all these things, but it still feels like playing the antagonist role. What do we do? Is there a Trojan horse, some way to get in that we can somehow, I have to say infiltrate, but somehow impact policy in this environment? NEHA, the National Environmental Health Association, we have about 5,000 members across the country, and I'm embarrassed and proud to say at the same time, we had our first Hill Day on February the 13th of 2017. We spent a lot of time with elected officials from red states, and I brought members from their jurisdictions, and uh, these folks are looking for some degree of shelter from the town hall storms that they are receiving. Is it Irina uh, in the front row here shared with me a story uh, about fracking in Maryland, if it's okay if I could share that, where the governor uh, was not supportive of fracking in the state of Maryland, where most of you live, uh, because of political issues, maybe not because of science and technology. And there's a real important lesson there for us. I have two degrees in public health 
but nothing in policy. But what I'm finding is connectivity and relationships are really important. And we need to be f focused on the public and public health early on. I think that there's a lot of political elite in the center. Uh, I stole that term from somebody else. It's not my term, political elite. But let's go to those folks that may not be obvious allies for us and begin to work with them systematically. Let's understand them as people. Let's understand where they live. Uh, let's bring our constituents to talk to them because they eat, drink, and breathe just like everybody else. And I think that's, that's a place to start, uh, at least on the, the policy end. In terms of employment, uh, I know that at Hopkins, I think you needed three years minimum to get into the, the master's program. That's not true in, in all programs. But it's very important to hone your craft as an environmental health professional. Make sure you know how to collect samples, what they mean, to interpret them, and to work with the public in understanding them. And I think those are two important uh, things that we could do uh, coming out of the gate here today. Next question right here. Can I, can oh, can I sorry, just add Joanna. really briefly, so I am not a scientist, so again, you just, but um, having spent um, the past four years working on the Toxic Substances Control Act on the Hill, two of the people that were really central in the discussions, one of them was a staffer, had backgrounds in, they were chemistry major, you know, they had chemistry majors, they were both AAAS fellows, actually had ended up there, but the there is a lack of scientific knowledge on the Hill, so people who are making policy on the Hill don't actually have, a lot of them don't have a background. So if you have any interest in policy, <laughs> I would certainly consider looking at bringing your background to, or if anybody who's interested, that, that there's a real need in policy discussions, because you know I can go out as a lobbyist and I have scientists to back me up at EDF, but a lot of folks don't have that, particularly on the Hill. So if anybody has interest, there is actually, um, I think, a lot of room there. That's great. Right here, please. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So thank you very much for a very engaging panel. I wanted to bring up another um, concept that I've heard a lot um, in the past couple of months, and that is that the, the states should be doing the environmental health. They should be doing public health protection. And we need to devolve these programs to the states. And I just wanted to get your reaction to that because, um, to some extent, some of the things you have said actually support that notion. Real quick, Paul, thanks for talking about the states. Uh, I worked in the state during the Reagan administration when EPA was not having a good time. And, and it was an incredible opportunity for New Jersey and California and other states to assume a leadership position. And, and Dave may want to add to this. Um, the California disconnect may be an example of that. The states are truly public health laboratories, and now is an important time. I, I would suggest that uh, the action is at the local level, but the federal agencies are so important for the science base uh, that informs practice. This is where it's very, I think, sobering if EPA is cut, if CDC is cut, if others are cut. Those folks, those boots on the ground that make things happen, they turn to DC for guidance. What should I be doing uh, in this? We, we just uh, put together three stories that we submitted to a Senate committee on how EPA's guidance was so helpful to solving a local problem. And it's that connection that we need, that story we need to reiterate over and over again and to be sure that those folks that voted for FISMA, the Food Safety Modernization Act, and that voted for TSCA reform, that we, we remind them of that because that got bipartisan support, both those bills during the last presidential administration. I also think it's an interesting question. I mean, I know there's, so lead paint and the EPA had a budget, 31% cut of the budget, and the program for, and I don't know the programs well enough because I was just scanning through, but the um, lead paint inspection program, so they're cutting the federal program, and then they're cutting the grant and devolving it to the states, but at the same time they're cutting the state grants for those programs. So they're cutting the program at both ends, um, and that's happening. So even if EPA is saying put it in the states, there's not money. And the other um, thing is enforcement is a real issue. Um, there just aren't a lot of enforcement officers in most states that can handle it. So if you don't have criminal enforcement coming from the EPA, the states just don't have. A friend was telling me who works at EPA about a story when he was in Virginia, hazardous waste was being dumped. They had, it was a state agreement that the state was going to handle it, but the state didn't have anybody who could go take the sample. You know, so if we, so there are, states have incredible roles and clearly they're leading the way in a lot of places, but so does the EPA. I think that would be the same. Yes, please. I really 
to ask you about the connection moving forward between environmental health and environmental medicine. I was a medical student here and I was so compelled by public health, earned my MBA sort of across the street. And that served me well in my act one. And I was working on an Indian reservation and the first week I was there, there was an infant who was short of breath. They got him to a triage hospital and was diagnosed with pneumonia and I said, uh-huh. I saw two minutes of that child, but this child did not have pneumonia. And the child had met hemoglobinemia. There had been contamination with nitrates from a chemical company that was close to the Indian land and Indian Health Service is regulated different than like federal law. It had a different regulatory policy so the dumping wasn't caught. Um, but my next step was to show the nitrates in the water uh, and it was all there because it was local environmental health and because of this case of one, this index case, it became uh, environmental medicine issue and Wick had me come to the Parkland building at the time and explain what I found and they changed their policies um, and had ready to use formula instead of the powdered formula and they weren't boiling the water for formula which was concentrating that. I'm making my question long but it had a, a big effect on me uh, that there is a connection between environmental medicine and the environmental health that I had taken here a few years before. I don't see that tradition continuing. We were talking about the states. Our own governor, once he was elected, came down with a cancer that I know because of occupational medicine. It was a cancer of the pesticides that he had just approved could be dumped on the eastern floor or the top cause of this kind of cancer. But why is that story not being told? An environmental medicine story at the local level that's also political. So if, if it was politically correct, I'd walk over and give you a hug because I, I, I agree with you so much. Uh, I just recently published a blog at Duke University on primary care environmental health integration. I think my profession is, is largely responsible because we talk to ourselves really well, but we don't even talk to our clinical friends very well. At our annual conference upcoming, uh, we've got uh, some medical folks from Duke coming to talk about the integration issue. I think uh, environmental health professionals have a long way to go. By the way, to become a registered environmental health specialist, it's the same basic science requirements as it is to take the MCAT and to get into the School of Medicine. So we have a lot in common uh, with, with the medical profession, but we have a long way to go. Uh, I was saddened to hear your story, but thank you for sharing it. I think we have time for one more question, and then I'm going to uh, ask Tom to give us a final word. Yes, right here. So this year, something I've heard in every single panel I've attended is the importance of talking to people that disagree with us. And I completely agree with that statement. Um, but with that in mind, a lot of people have said, that's why we shouldn't do things like these marches over the next two weekends. Mm. But I disagree. I, I'm really excited to go to this march. So I'm wondering your thoughts on these marches and what could be specifically done to improve mobilization efforts like that to actually influence policy in this area? <laughs> I mean, um, on the marches, great. <laughs> um, I think, um, you know, EDF is, is supporting both. Um, I, I, I think a couple things. One is, I think, in terms of the marches, in terms of being heard, I mean, one of the things we've seen with the town hall meetings, which is that they're not particularly, uh, they're not popular with a lot of members, but they are actually people are being heard. They are actually having an impact in a very interesting way. We saw early on with a, a Senate race, uh, the 2018 Senate races um, are not looking very favorable for Democrats um, because of the states that are up. So they're, they're called the vulnerable 2018ers. Um, and we saw one of them actually take a more environmental stand. And we think it was because of the, actually the, um, the Women's March 
because so many women from her district, had, her state had come and been active and very vocal that she realized that she, they were not gonna be quiet. Um, so that's a little bit different than um, talking to people from the other side. And I have to say that at EDF, we actually spend a fair amount of time. Um, that's one of the things that EDF does is we work with industry a lot. Um, so you might not have noticed that from what I said. <laughs> but we do actually work with industry a lot. What we do is we differentiate, though, where we're working in, uh, towards a collective similar goal and where we think behavior is outside the bounds of acceptable and we need to call people, right, that, that there are different um, places. So I think you have to find your own way there. Um, but I do think that, um, I don't think that being loud and public, um, I think it, it it's actually can be very powerful in terms of that people actually need to pay attention to you. And since I work with the Hill, that members of the people on the Hill, the senators and representatives, get that there's going to be a consequence. So I don't know if either of you want to answer more nuance. But. Here, here. <laughs> Tom, do you have any final thoughts for us before we end our session? I sure do. And, and, I knew you and, would. <laughs> so, so how do we connect these dots? Really important things came up today. And Sterling, thanks for your question. The answer is the risk sciences courses. Um, um, just had to put that in. But the connections, the connections that, that sometimes we fail to see in academia, to the front lines, uh, to the practice of public health. You can't do the core functions of public health and the essential services we teach all of you without a strong environmental protection agency to really be the backstop for emergencies, but the promoter of the science. We have to be aware of that. We have to see the connections between the clinical community and the practitioners on the front lines of public health. One of the things that I think we're guilty of when we get immersed in the science is a little bit of forgetfulness of why are we actually doing this? All right. and, I, and I have to tell you, I, I used to get a lot of, of crazy looks at EPA when in the middle of a crisis I would say, yeah, but why are we doing this risk assessment? Let's remember the fundamental cause why we're in Flint. It's not to master the art of drinking water treatment. It's to prevent those exposures to the kids that might affect them forever and their neurodevelopment and, and, their, and their neurological health. And we are that public health foundation that's so important to environmental policy, to, to uh, the, the application of evidence to making this a healthier place. And so I think as, as we move forward, yeah, EPA is in crisis right now. And I don't know how we got there, but I do know why we're there. I don't think anyone is shouting for reduced public health protection. They are shouting for reduced regulation and for better economic opportunities. Those are two different goals. Those who are well served by deregulation, perhaps really not with jobs and workers as their goal, will take this opportunity and fund this opportunity to turn back the clock on regulation. But we have to see this. We have to be involved in the political process. We have to be there supporting the evidence. And I think the universities have a really important role. One of the things I didn't mention, and one of the reasons why California is so strong as an environmental leader is the university system there. We have to be involved, as many of you are, with the state of Maryland, but we have to do better. We have to be involved in the policies that matter for public health, and you have to be a little bit fearless. So as we think about, should I stay or should I go with the march, um, I'll be out of the country, and, I, and I'm really disappointed because I know that I would go, but I don't want that to be seen as an anti-Trump rally. I don't want it to be seen as a partisan battle. I hope no fights break out. I, I don't think scientists are really all, all that, you know, Jersey. Um, but, the, but, but there are some from Jersey who might just be tempted to, to mix it up. And so maybe it's better I stay away. Uh, uh, but I think this discussion has been terrific because your questions identified the key issues. It was a great panel that covered the, the local front lines to the Hill, which Let's face it, most of us are a little afraid of and, and have not been very involved in. 
And the fact that the Hill, the biggest changes may actually come from the lawmakers, not from the White House. I, I hope your consciousness has been raised, and I hope EPA will not be a stranger to all of you because many of us probably stop thinking about EPA as a public health agency, and it really is. I'll stop. Tom, it's wonderful to have you back at Hopkins. Please join me in thanking our panelists.